with the presence of professionals across the globe. Initially, we thought MBA is organizing a small national event, but it, it turned out to be a spectacular international event. And that is all because you have joined. And at this point, I also want to say a lot of work. Uh, Dr. Mohan Isaac put behind this, a lot of emails with helping the, the, the offices and the managing committee. Thank you for joining. I have, the, I have to acknowledge the presence of several major international professional organizations present with its top leaders representing them. There are a lot of names which I'm not going to already Dr. Monix introduced some of them. I also acknowledge the presence of mental health professionals and the health practitioners and professionals from rehabilitation work from reputed institutions in India leaders of Indian Psychiatric Society, Indian Association of Social, Social Psychiatry, and representations from prestigious institutions, colleges, and universities. We also acknowledge the presence of administrators, professional staff, and counselors of many NGOs, which are similar to MBA, presented in this meeting. These NGOs primarily involved in promotion of mental health as well as rehabilitation. I warmly welcome the family members of late Dr. Joyce Romani, Naveen and Amita with us and along with other family members, it is a joy to have you with us. The residents, a few of their family members, the staff and the volunteers, the, the AGM members, and the managing committee members of MBA present here. I, on behalf of MBA Bangalore, I welcome each one of you. We value your presence. Hope all of us will be enriched by you, this unique occasion. Thank you. Thank you, sir. It was indeed a warm welcome. As we know, the Medico Pastel Association has a proud legacy of over 50 glorious years. It would be very pertinent for us to throw some light onto the genesis and introduction to MPA. To this, I'm pleased to invite the former secretary of MPA, Mrs. Ramola Joseph, who has a long association with MPA to give us this introduction. Greetings to everyone. It's so lovely to see all the old people whom we've not met for so many years. Medico Pastoral Association, MPA, began in 1964 by St. Mark's Cathedral Urban Industrial Outreach Mission. Homeless people with mental illness, alcohol or narcotic abuse were lying, dying on Bangalore's road. A group of medical doctors and the pastoral team, spearheaded by Joyce Ceremony, trained volunteers to take care of them during the day. Then the great need arose for a place to shelter them. Dr. Joyce, a lady of compassion, conviction, and courage, along with the medical and pastoral team, included government and political police officers and searched till land was located. Medico Pastoral Association, appropriately named, was legally registered as a society in 1972. It has always been and is to date totally secular, open to every caste and creed and culture. MPA is the first non governmental organization, a halfway home for folk recovering from mental disorders and a pioneer in community-based rehabilitation. Now, half a century later, despite all the challenges met and faced, MPA steadfastly continues the journey with God's mercy. From a wild jungle of a land given on lease for 30 years and constructing buildings to buying the land from the Bangalore Municipal Corporation, the first building which you see now 
looked like a fort with a moat, but it had no bridge. Just in time for its inauguration, Dr. Joyce and team built the bridge, literally a bridge to connect with the community. After 1975, the halfway home, the auditorium, and two cottages for the staff were built. In 1987, the Navajivan Hostel, followed by the extended stay facility, and in 2000, the training center plus the staff quarters. One cottage then turned into a family guest house. Family members joined in family group meetings and residence day programs. Previously, there was a daycare facility and home visits by the counselors. MPA is grateful for every gift received from donors. Of special mention, late Reverend Father Jovita D'Souza, who was actively interested in promoting counseling. He was the earliest donor member to the halfway home, to Alzira D'Souza Memorial Training Center, and he gave a major donation to save MPA's property. Psychiatrists and mental health professionals trained counselors to care for residents, gave talks, especially on suicide prevention, and started Alcoholic and Narcotic Anonymous in the early years. From simple awareness programs in schools and networking with other NGOs and the public, seminars and conferences were organized. MPA is a member of the Karnataka Association for Psychosocial Re Disability and the World Association for Psychosocial Rehabilitation India. It has been represented in international conferences as well. In 2002, MPA launched Sahai, the first suicide prevention helpline in Karnataka. Dedicated trained volunteers attend to cries for help. From caring volunteers, from caring volunteers to professionals and support staff, all have to comply with the Mental Health Act 2012 and the Rights of Persons with Disabilities Act 2016 and all government laws. Even after professional counselors and structured programs began, volunteers came to teach English, yoga, arts, crafts, cooking. They joined in games, singing, dancing, aerobics, picnics festivals, and fundraising events. Anyone else willing to follow MPA's guidelines to be a volunteer, even a virtual volunteer, is welcome. Every single volunteer was and is still considered, considered a precious asset. In conclusion, by God's grace and guidance, may MPA continue this unique journey and scale to greater heights. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for the concise introduction. This evening is to commemorate the first Dr. Joy Shiromani Memorial Oration. Towards this end, may I now call upon Dr. Ajit Devire, the Vice President of MPA, to introduce, to speak to us about Dr. Joyce and also introduce us to the event. Thank you, uh, Deepanjana. Bhaskar, may I have my slides, please? Joyce John, Joyce Kamalini John, to be precise, was born in Madras, now called Chennai, in 1929. The youngest and only daughter born after four brothers to a senior government official. Joyce lost her mother when she was at the tender age of eight, but she remembers a child, she remembered her childhood as pleasant. Her father's postings across the country took her, among other places, to Karachi and Peshawar in undivided India and also to Amritsar. She then moved to her aunt in Bezwada in order to stabilize her studies, where she helped in her aunt's nursing home. This is where she first displayed her compassion for the ill. After completing her matriculation, she entered the prestigious Christian Medical College, Vellore, 
Here she showed her leadership qualities and was elected president of the student Christian movement. She went on to complete her post-graduation from the Royal College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, London. She joined her father in Allahabad, and while working there, she met Paul Siromani, her future husband. After her wedding, Mr. Siromani and she traveled briefly to the US. Returning to India, the Siromanis came and settled in Bangalore for a while. The story of how she set up the MPA was, inst or was instrumental in doing so is quite interesting. It was in connection with a nurse by the name of Teresa, who had been sent back to India from Europe, where she had been working on account of, she was sent back on account of a mental breakdown. Teresa was treated at the famed All India Institute of Mental Health, now the National Institute of Mental Health and Neurosciences, Bangalore. She made a good recovery, but was then not welcome in the house of her in-laws, nor would her family in Kerala have her back. At Dr. Joyce's behest and with the active support of Mr. Sirogoni, they took this girl into their own home and kept her there till she could get back on her feet professionally and find a place for herself to stay. This turning point gave her the idea of involvement in rehabilitating the mentally unwell, even after they are cured. She met with Dr. S.S. Jairam, the first psychiatrist in private practice in Bangalore and Nimhan's alumnus, who was not merely sympathetic to the cause, but actively supported her. With the help of other social service people and the police, uh, Dr. Jairam brought this venture forward. Dr. Jairam suggested that she meet uh, with the great neurosurgeon, the dynamic Dr. R. M. Varma, then director of the All India Institute of Mental Health. And with great support, too, from her church and the St. Mark's Cathedral, the medical clergy, the medical and clergy collaboration was born as the Medico Pastoral Association in 1964. Mrs. Ramona Joseph has already acquainted us with the growth of the NPA. I might only add that this restless lady devoted to the altruistic cause never tired of newer projects to promote rehab in mental health. And she was the reason that the country's first halfway home came to be established in Bangalore at the MPA. Dr. Joyce had a 17 year stint in Bangalore and then moved to Kolkata where she took up the cause again and established the Paripurnata, the first halfway home in that part of the country. This, these projects of hers got her many awards and accolades but she was never complacent about these awards or her work as is evidenced from her speech at the Silver Jubilee of Paripurnata. In later years, she moved to Chennai, where she helped with Banyan, a well-known rehab facility for the mentally ill, especially the homeless and the abandoned. Let me share with you some thoughts Dr. Joyce had written when we had her over at the NPA. She was then 86 years old. Lessons learned. My close interaction with the mentally ill has taught me many lessons, that they are human beings first and then patients. My attitude towards them changed as I saw them as persons who suffer intensely. My second lesson was that a mentally ill person's dignity and respect should not be could be lost in most government hospitals where he or she might become a non-entity. A person's self-dignity has to be safeguarded and restored. However, berserk the person may seem to be behaving. My third learning was that one assumes a purely professional role by uh, relating to a mentally ill person, then one tends to deal with him or her as a case and forgetting him as a person. I recall the time I spent with a senior administrator of a reputed psychiatric center in Kolkata, during which a resident recognized him and offered him grapes on a plate. The administrator refused in spite of assurances from the resident that the grapes were clean and washed. To me, that girl's action to share her grapes was a spontaneous act of joy and gratitude. I I felt of gratitude at her, her human self slowly emerging. In reusing her spontaneous offering, refusing her spontaneous offering, the administrator was not aware that he was doing what he was doing to her personhood. Looking back at the experience of those years, I have realized the importance of the following, which I was upheld, which has upheld us to the venture to uncharted areas of concern and to sustain the work in the midst of trials and difficulties. Chennai was where Joyce came into the world and it was the same city which saw her close her eyes upon it in 2018. 
Many in the mental health community, and especially those working in the rehab across the country, bid farewell to this pioneer of psychiatric rehabilitation that day. One might get the impression of an ascetic altruist reading about her. Altruistic, she was indeed, to a fault. But she was a great lover of fun and frolic, a great cook, a good teller of tales, a talented mimic and singer, and fearless in approaching anyone for any services or help. She did not consider them favors, or and nor did she consider that she was doing the community any favor. Also a patriot at heart and totally devoted to her family. Her beloved spouse, Paul Sroboni, completed his PhD at the young age of 90, and she was immensely proud of this achievement. My, my side project, she told me. We are blessed to have with us today, Mr. Paul Sroboni, as well as uh, uh, Dr. Joyce's children, Amita Nayaj Sroboni, who works in HR in Ghana, and a son, Naveen, who has his own art-based enterprise in New Delhi. I must thank Amita for her help in putting together my profile of the great Dr. Joyce. And we at MPA are thrilled that Naveen has offered us his expertise for our campus, where he remembers playing and loitering as a boy while mom worked at the organization. When MPA decided to have an activity to galvanize our members into action, we decided it would be an oration in the name of the great lady. And how befitting it is that we have the prominent, uh, preeminent psychiatrist, Professor Norman Sartorius, to give us this, the first Dr. Joyce Shiromani Memorial Oration today. Thank you very much for your patient listening. A thing of beauty, they say, is a joy forever. A thing of beauty, we say, is Joyce forever. Thank you, sir. Thank you for all those valuable information. Now, as we inch closer to the momentous occasion, I request Dr. Mohan Isaac to introduce a distinguished orator, Professor Dr. Norman Sartorius, and then invite him to deliver the oration. Sir, please. Thank you. Thank you, Dibanjana. Thank you, Ramola, for uh, your uh, historical description of the growth of Medical Partial Association. Thank you, Ajit Bide, for telling us about the life and works of Dr. Joyce Romani. Uh, MPA is really uh, proud and privileged to have uh, a pioneering psychiatrist internationally recognized as Dr. Norman Sartorius to deliver the first Dr. Joyce Romani Memorial Oration. My great pleasure to introduce him it has given me five minutes to introduce it. Five minutes is too short a period to introduce such an illustrious person as Dr. Sartorius. Anyway, I'll try and do my best. Dr. Norman Sartorius is currently the president of the Association for the Improvement of Mental Health Programs in Geneva. Uh, I would begin by his present work. This is a small non-governmental organization in, based in Geneva but doing really international work. And I'll quickly tell you five things which this organization does. It uh, is currently working on coexisting morbidities, that is the coexistence of physical illness and mental illness. He has been leading a project, international project, on the coexistence of diabetes and depression. Secondly, this organization works for fighting stigma with, against mental disorders. Stigma of mental disorders is a universal problem. Thirdly, Dr. Sartorius spearheads the program which is run all over the world in different countries, including India, which is called Leadership and Professional Skills Training Program for Young Early Career Psychiatrists. Uh, this is being uh, held regularly every year in Japan, in Germany, in India, along with the uh, 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 international conferences of uh, uh, world bodies such as the World Psychiatric Association. And currently, after the COVID, uh, he is uh, uh, working out a methodology of conducting these programs because the last six months, he has not been able to run any of these programs. In fact, there was one to be held in Indonesia, which has been again and again uh, postponed. Fourthly, uh, uh, this organization works for improving mental health programs all over the world. And Dr. Sartorius carries out this work through uh, 
uh, the World Psychiatric Association. And lastly, the association is actively involved in publishing research papers, books, guidelines, etc. So although it's a small organization based in Geneva, Dr. Sartorius and his association's presence is all over the world. Now, coming to his past work, which I have quickly shown in the slide, he was formerly the director of the Division of Mental Health, World Health Organization for over 45 years. That is where I had the privilege to work with him more than a quarter century ago. Uh, uh, he has done numerous things and we, time will not permit me to say what all he has done, but let me just quickly tell you three things. Uh, he began his career in the World Health Organization in 1967 with his first posting in New Delhi, uh, during which time, during the one year that he spent in Delhi, he went all over India, went to all the mental health centers and all the mental hospitals. And I think that is how he developed a love for India because uh, subsequently he has come back to India several times. He chose uh, uh, Agra as one of the centers for the international pilot study of schizophrenia, which he led. And in the last uh, nine or 10 years, every year he has been coming to uh, Nimhans in Bangalore to conduct the early leadership and uh, professional skills pro program for early career psychiatrists. He has also been uh, uh, the principal investigator of a program which the WHO spearheaded called the uh, WHO Strategies for Extending Mental Health Services uh, in Developing Countries. Chandigarh, the Postgraduate Institute of Medical Education, so Chandigarh was a center. So that in a way, brought on the ways of sending, extending mental health care to remote areas of developing countries in Asia, Africa, and uh, South America. Uh, there are numerous other things. He also spearheaded the classification of mental disorders. He worked on developing a, a, you know, standardized instruments for assessment. So he had a glorious career in the WHO. He retired as a director of the Division of uh, Mental Health. It was a division then. When he started, it was a one-man unit. He built it up to a division with more than three, four dozen people working with huge grants, etc. After retirement, he became the president of the World Psychiatric Association. He was a president-elect from 93. He retired from WHO in 93. 93 to 96, he was the president-elect. And 96 to 99, he was the president. Later, he also became the president of the European Association of Psychiatrists. He has more than 400 publications, which are papers, books, book chapters, etc. He is often referred to as one of the most influential psychiatrists of our times. And uh, last year, later last year, the prestigious medical journal, Lancet Psychiatry, described him, profiled him as psychiatrist living legend. So, Dr. Sartorius, we are indeed fortunate to have you to deliver this oration. Uh, as uh, uh, before the oration started, we saw various people who are attending this program. And uh, uh, I wrote to some of my colleagues in Medical Parcel Association, the people who are attending this program extend from Indiana in USA. I saw Larry Simino's face uh, to Invercargill in the southern tip of uh, 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 New Zealand. Uh, you know, these are different time zones, etc. But I think it is a regard for Medical Partial Association, its founder secretary, Dr. Joyce Romani, and all about, all about everything, the orator of this evening, Dr. Norman Sartorius, that they are all uh, participating. And I, this is also currently live streaming on MPA's Facebook uh, account. So a lot more than the number who appear here are watching this program from various places. So, Dr. Sartorius, thank you very much for agreeing to do this. And may I now invite you to deliver the first Dr. Joyce Romani oration for Medical Pastoral Association. Welcome, Dr. Sartorius. Dr. Sartorius, you can unmute and begin your oration. Thank you very much, Professor Mohan. Thank you very much also to Dr. George and for the uh, association, the pastoral association. I am greatly honored and uh, very pleased to be able to be with you. And I want to uh, also say how much admiration I have for the work that has been described as what the association is doing. 
I think it's a beacon of light uh, and an important initiative which should inspire not only people in India, but also in many other countries of the world where the fate of the mentally ill people after they've been given treatment and many of them don't receive even treatment, but even those who have received treatment very often left uh, at large after the disease has been a, a somewhat controlled uh, without help, without support, without uh, somehow an opportunity to be embedded back into the society in which they are. Now, <clears throat> I also want to thank uh, as Dr. Mohan did to all of my uh, uh, colleagues and friends who got up very early or uh, in other ways sacrificed their uh, time to come and uh, be present on this occasion. I've been invited to speak about the pandemics of, uh, uh, excuse me, I have to now try to get my slides on the school. And it says here that I have disabled something. How can I do this? I do not know. Um, share slides. Click on the share yes, slides arrow at the bottom. Oh, it's much better now. Oh, yes. Yes, they have appeared. Put it on the slideshow. So I have the... Uh, I'll try to speak a little bit about the pandemics of the mind. And I think that... Uh, uh, this will be a view I put down uh, of the year 2020, because I wouldn't be surprised in a few years, the uh, views on that pandemic and what we have experienced or what we are experiencing will be to a very large extent completely different. I think there are some self-evident facts which are important. The first one, this is not the first time that human societies are experiencing an epidemic of such vast proportions. Here, I, I've listed a few of the ones which are most frequently mentioned, the huge number of uh, people who have died. Uh, approximately 40% of the population of the world has been killed by plague epidemics over the years. Uh, even now, every so often, there is a fright that plague may be spreading, and we have had several beginning epidemics in the last uh, 15 or 20 years. Then there was the very large epidemic that we have seen with the, uh, what was called the Spanish flu, which although uh, it was not starting in Spain, uh, has uh, got that name because uh, for political reasons. And it is a uh, epidemic that at the time uh, cost the life of uh, many millions of people worldwide and uh, came back on two or three occasions lasting for several years and uh, destroying much uh, of what was left over after the First World War as well. And then there was also the, what was called the Russian flu. It was a uh, epidemic that is less well described. It is one that started in St. Petersburg, somewhere in 1898. And then it went and spread. And curiously enough, that disease has uh, then reached England very quickly, probably because of the maritime connections. Uh, many of the very well-known people from England at the time had been hit by it. For example, the uh, Prime Minister, Lord Salisbury, has been the first one to suffer from it. Mr. Balfour, who has really got his fame by uh, uh, his rather inept uh, handling of the uh, question of the Palestine, has also been sick at the time, and a number of others. And the flu, I'm mentioning it because it has one feature which is more similar to the current uh, uh, COVID epidemic than any other disease, which is that after the acute uh, disease, which lasted for several days, 10 to 15 days, there was what is called, there was a tail to the disease, which went on for several months. And very often this tail of the disease contains some neurological signs, mild paresis, sometimes uh, problems with hearing, problems with seeing, problems with the uh, sight of, uh, with a sense of uh, taste, uh, and these you know, neurological problems, as well as tiredness and exhaustion and uh, uneasy feelings have continued for weeks after the disease has happened. And what we are seeing now with the coronavirus epidemic is that there is a significant proportion of people who are not only experiencing the disease for a couple of weeks, but then after that, have a sort of a tail. Uh, they've been called, I think in, in England, they've been called the long haulers because they so their disease is lasting in much lesser form 
for quite a, quite a while. Then there was a variety of flus that have followed one another. One of them in particular has led the World Health Organization to, uh, to uh, speak of a pandemic, which fortunately didn't happen. Uh, that was another one that was also uh, capturing the world. HIV AIDS is another epidemic of our time. There are still some 18 million people who are suffering from that disease. 18 million people whose life now seems to be saved, but uh, who are nevertheless uh, 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 suffering and whose life has been significantly changed. Uh, I think I have a question. Everybody, yeah. please unmute, except the speaker. Right. Well, it's nice to know that somebody else is speaking. Uh, the, uh, I think that the another uh, major set of epidemics, which we have almost forgotten because they were so frequent, has been the pest that has gone with malaria, which kept coming up in waves, and uh, they were controlled. And then again, they, there was a significant reduction of the attention given to the disease with a new outbursts that have been uh, described as the returning outbursts of malaria, something that we are now experiencing with uh, COVID as well, because COVID is uh, happening and then there are strict rules, but as soon as the rules are a little bit loosened, the disease springs up back in the second, third, or whichever number of waves it will have. Uh, the typhoid epidemics have killed hundreds of thousands of people, particularly uh, they've killed uh, soldiers in wars, but also other people who didn't have access to water that was appropriately uh, uh, safe. Uh, and so I think there was a number of other diseases of this type that has been, uh, tuberculosis is another one, a major epidemic that has been gradually. So this undoubtedly is one of the facts that we have to keep in mind. It's not the first time that we have a disease of that type of COVID present with us. It's not at all certain that we shall not have many more similar pandemics in the future. I'm just listing here one of the pandemic which is likely to happen with other viruses that are present in bats. There has been a very interesting paper that has described very recently the number of uh, viruses which are present in the bat, uh, but which are at present not spreading to humans. But the problem is that as we are deforesting and diminishing the surface covered by forests, and as towns are expanding their size, the bats which were previously living in forests are now entering into towns. And by coming into towns themselves, they also bring their diseases. And uh, one of the set of diseases are due to the population of viruses which they have and which they are welcome, which they are spreading uh, to human. Uh, and might spread the human in the future as well in one or another form. But in addition to the uh, catastrophes that may happen when a disease strikes humanity, there are other sources of catastrophe that are also not too far. I'm thinking of, uh, for example, the first consequences of the global warming in which uh, our friends in, uh, in Bangladesh will be particularly aware uh, because of the consequences in terms of the raising sea levels and all the bad consequences that might have uh, come with that. And then, of course, the human-made uh, uh, problems that are also present. We have been speaking about disasters, but this is really, humans are also very good makers of disasters. And the main main disasters are threatening us because of the ever more powerful weapon uh, and ever more uh, weak uh, feeling of how they should be controlled and what should be done with them. So that's, a, I think, a second very important point about the COVID one. There are, however, differences in the current epidemic which make it really different from previous epidemics and I think will also make them different from some future epidemics as well. Here is the first of these differences. The main problem of the COVID is not so much that it is a disease which strikes people, but it is a disease which adds itself to other problems which are already existing and kills. So that the epi uh, epidemic of COVID will infect hit people who have cardiovascular illness or cancer or 
other chronic conditions, diabetes, etc., and will contribute to the mortality of these people. It's a one of the reasons that people are now using a term which is called syndemic uh, rather than epidemic. Syndemic being the simultaneous presence of two or more diseases which are hitting the population at the same time and are reinforcing each other's negative effects. The the term syndemic has been introduced in the 1990s. It's gradually coming and used. And I think that the COVID-1 uh, epidemic or pandemic is now a very good example of the, such a disease where the main problem comes from the addition of the new disease to the previous ones, leading to a threshold which then is broken should it, uh, and which uh, uh, leads to a significant number of problems. The second major difference that is there concerning the COVID compared with other diseases or other pandemics is that the world in which disease is now happening is really a world that is different from the one it was in the past. Transfer of people and transport is more easy than ever before. And it's much faster than it was ever before. People worldwide are connected by internet, by television, by telephone. It is any news that happens any place is spread worldwide in no time at all. We are also now at a point where the population of the world has grown even further, uh, reaching the level of approximately 8 billion people. 8 billion people would not be so bad if there wasn't 800 million people who are, uh, in fact, uh, extremely poor, living on less than a dollar uh, per I think uh, for their existence of all needs uh, per day. Uh, and I think that the, the uh, number of these uh, people is continuously growing. Although the United Nations have proudly announced that their proportion has gone down, that they are not anymore 12 to 15%, but now only 10%, but the total number of them has gone up because the total number of the population, uh, numbers of the population have also grown. I already mentioned the global warming. And one particular factor that I think is of enormous importance is that the last few decades have not seen anymore a continuous emphasis on the need for universal solidarity between people. Solidarity between countries, solidarity between people in the same country, solidarity between people in the same family or across families between different religion and between different uh, um, places where they live. And I think that their lack of the international of emphasis on the universal solidarity, the absence of enforcing universal solidarity principles from school to uh, uh, any other to legislation or to other activities of humans is one factor that is of particular importance. Another factor that is making this last epidemic of COVID so different from others is that it is a disease which is very likely going to create much more damage in the highly developed countries and in the rich countries than in the poorer countries. Number one, because of the successes of medicine, something that Professor Ernest Grunberg many years ago has been calling the failures of our success. The fact that many of the people whom we have managed to maintain alive despite of their illnesses they are now present in much larger numbers. And the uh, epidemic of COVID presents an acute, serious, major uh, risk to their lives. And there are more of them in the countries which have managed to prolong their life and prolong their life expectancy. An interesting fact here, which I think is of great importance, is that while the life expectancy in most developed countries, uh, highly industrialized countries, has significantly grown, the expectancy of disease and disability-free years has remained stable. That is, we have an increasingly large population which has disease and disability. And although they live longer, they are more vulnerable, they are more fragile, they are more likely to suffer from diseases such as those which come in addition in a syndemic way to hit them and then to cause damage to their life or kill them. Another reason that uh, developed uh, in industrialized countries are likely to suffer more is because the uh, emphasis 
on democratic governance. I'm living now in Switzerland. It's a wonderful country. It has a, uh, everything you can imagine. It is a, uh, uh, human rights are being enforced. Um, we have a, uh, in Switzerland, a high standard of living, a very high minimum salary, very good health care, everything you want. Many, many good things. Switzerland is it's a small country. It is, I think, about a quarter or no, a third of the size of New Delhi, uh, about uh, uh, half of the size of Bangalore. Uh, but it is, it, it's uh, 8 million people. It is divided into 26 cantons. And each of the canton has a significant amount of independence. And each of the canton has a number of municipalities. And each of the municipalities has an independence. They vote on everything that happens. So you have in Switzerland, perhaps as much as two occasions to vote to or elect per month. Now that's a lot of voting, but it also means that all decisions which are taken in a democratic way are not necessarily the same from one canton to another. So for example, in Geneva, which is one of the cantons, which has about 500,000 population, uh, the rules are different from the canton that is next door. So that the, uh, um, the headdressers will have to be closed in uh, the Geneva canton, but they are open next door so that there is a continuous traffic. And the cantons are not in agreement about what they should be doing. But what is true on the level of Switzerland with its cantons and municipalities is also true at the level of Europe. So that the countries of Europe have different rules and enforce them at a different time. The skiing desert resorts are open in Switzerland, but close in France. Uh, the food can be imported from Denmark into Germany, but not into Poland. There's a variety of differences and that makes it very much more difficult because the fight against a disease is a battle which has to be led with a strategy that is common to all the elements, to all the so forces that are being involved. And that of course is not the case when you have a huge amount of involvement and discussion and voting and democratic concerns that are present. Other reasons that make developed countries particularly vulnerable is that the international mobility of the population is very high. And of course, also that the uh, urbanization has become, uh, has been so fast and so rapid that the population density has been increased to a large extent. Not only, of course, in the highly developed countries, but also in others, for example, in Argentina, where now 95% of the population lives in towns on top of one another. And controlling a disease where people are so close and have to be so close to one another is, of course, particularly difficult. Now, in addition or to all of this, there is also another uh, dangerous and at the same time uh, um, novel uh, problem that is emerging worldwide. And that in addition to the syndemic where these diseases try to rob you of your life, there is also an infodemic. That is the spread of information without any control, very often misleading you, very often being controversial or contradictory to one another. And this, uh, uh, there is no responsibility that is assigned to people who emit news or emit rules or emit other things, uh, which are contrary to what has been said before, which make people insecure which of set of rules to follow, which makes them uncertain about what is in fact happening. And this infodemic, sometimes with malevolent views, sometimes with malevolent news, sometimes with idiots who are in fact uh, joking and putting out information that is incorrect is another major problem. And of course, the problem with this kind of infodemic is that if you were to, uh, try to control it, you would have to introduce measures of control which can be misused and can stop the freedom of speech, can stop the freedom of communication and many other things which we consider as great advances in recent years. So that uh, I think that uh, another reason that is present that these infodemics producers are very often people who have not a sense that they have a responsibility to other people to the welfare of people in the world and just emit those news as if this matter not at all. So all of this makes this particular last pandemic different from others. It has created a number of problems and you are aware as much as I'm of the information about all this. 
we have seen that the psychological problems, for example, anxiety and depression has been increased in numbers. There is a numerous studies now, and these studies are confirming one after the other that in the population, there is an increase on one hand of a feeling of unhappiness, of feeling of uncertainty, but also of depressive disorders and of anxiety disorders. The more uh, central psychiatric disorders such as schizophrenia and manic depressive illness did not for the moment show any differences in their uh, uh, appearance. But uh, certainly for the, what one would call common mental disorders, they have shown a significant increase. This is in addition to bad feelings, bad mood and feelings of unhappiness and real concerns and worries that people have, what will happen tomorrow? What will happen with my life and with the life of my children? There is a Japanese problem, which is called hikikomori. It is a uh, syndrome that has been described in Japan first, in which a young person in general withdraw from the world. And they withdraw, and then uh, they don't want any contact with anybody. This has been described now in Japan, but also in many other countries. And the clinical symptoms that are present in people who have withdrawn in this way are a variety. They have curious ideas. They have very often suicidal ideas. They also uh, speak about themselves and see themselves in a, in a very negative and diminishing way. And the same symptoms that have been present in those people who withdraw voluntarily to not have contact with anybody have also been described in large numbers in people who are forced to be separated from others by the rules of confinement, which are being present in many countries. Other health consequences of the COVID pandemic is the high mortality of people, much higher mortality of people who have chronic diseases than of the people who do not have them. And of course, somewhat surprising, but not very surprising, the higher mortality rate of people who uh, have COVID as well as a mental disorder. Partly this is describable, uh, explicable by the fact that <clears throat> people with mental disorder are very often poor, very often without a stable lifestyle, very often without a family, very often without support from the community. But there may be something more than that, which leads to uh, the increased mortality uh, that is present in many, many uh, studies that have been done recently. And then there are what is called remote health consequences. These are those that you don't see today. Uh, for example, they have been in many countries, they have stopped vaccination of children because they need them health staff to help the people who are sick. But the children who have not been vaccinated against some of the current diseases are very likely to be sick from diseases, not today, but in a few years time because they were not vaccinated on time. And the habit of vaccination is also broken. It's no longer normal. Yes, it's year, end of year number one, I have to go and get the shots for one, two, and three. There is no such thing anymore. And even if you go and look for somebody who will vaccinate your children, they say they are too busy, they can't do it now. It's tragic that this is happening at the time when we are almost getting rid of some of the major problems. For example, despite of everything in June of this year, uh, WHO has announced that polio has been eradicated from Africa. It's only a small number of cases that are still present in the, on the Southeast Asian part of the world, the continent. Uh, it would be a terrible thing if because of the current efforts uh, to deal with COVID, we stop the campaigns, we stop the effort to eradicate yet another disease. Uh, there is also other programs that have been stopped. For example, I'll give you just one of them, is the uh, postponement of cancer detection problem, uh, programs, where people have been, for example, women have been invited and many of them take, took the habit to have regular uh, checkups to make sure that maybe they do not, uh, so to be able to discover the presence of a uh, cancer early in its development. These programs have in many countries been postponed or stopped until further notice, which means that those who will be not discovering their cancer early enough will in fact be discovered much later when this disease has progressed and when the treatment may be more difficult. Stop smoking programs have stopped in many countries. 
emphasis on stopping alcohol and drug problems has stopped in many countries. Although one of the constant finding worldwide is that the abuse of substances such as alcohol and drugs has increased in areas that have been hit by COVID. Uh, many of the elderly people and people with chronic diseases have to go to get their care to a facility and they have to take the public transport to get there. They have to wait to be seen. And all of this has been disturbed by the present disease control measures, which means that they are not controlling themselves regularly. And doctors don't come to their home because they're busy doing other things. And so many of these whose uh, health has been kept at an acceptable level because of frequent controls and regular treatment have in fact been also uh, now put at a particular danger to their life uh, and to their quality of life. Now, doctors and uh, uh, nurses in all countries are complaining that the over overcharging which they have with duties that have been pro produced by COVID has led them to an exhaustion, to a what is called the burnout syndrome. Too many tasks, very often not enough recognition, no particular additional incentives, a very difficult situation. And these people, in fact, function less well and treat less well. And so that the quality of care, despite of all goodwill, even where it is maintained, has been reduced in quality and quantity because of the exhaustion and the burnout syndromes among doctors and other uh, health workers in the field. This is uh, pure health consequences, but there is a number of psychosocial consequences as well. In many countries, there have been reports of intrafamilial violence and problems within the family, not least uh, particularly severe in the poor because they live very often at an extremely restricted space of maybe 25 to 30 square meters, 25 square meters for a family of five. Uh, which have to be in their house for all of the hours of the day or most of the hours of the day and the night. <clears throat> and the chance is that there will be friction which grows sometimes to violence and problems and alcohol taking, God knows what, are very much higher. And this, I think, intrafamilial violence is a phenomenon that has been present everywhere. The fact that it's intrafamilial means that it is very likely due to the grouping of closing the doors and closing contacts with other people and making people survive at a very narrow and confined space. People are, of course, also terribly worried because of the expectation of what will happen later. Many of them have lost jobs uh, and that worries them enormously. Reports from many countries in which agricultural workers are in fact being discharged with anything without any help whatsoever and travel home under difficult conditions, carrying disease with them, but also coming to home, which they left because there wasn't enough money to sustain them there, is a major problem as well. And then is, of course, the number of professions which are likely to vanish. Uh, the, one of the people who has made most money on this uh, time during the uh, COVID has been the owners of the Amazon uh, empire, where many more people than ever before are ordering things and gradually making shops in useless because it's so much easier to write it down and to get it sent to your home while rather than go and wait in some, off, in some shop to be served or to travel for I don't know how long to do it. So that it is likely that salesmen, people who are servers in restaurants and many other of these people, people are interested or working in transport industry aeroplanes, for example, et cetera, will all lose their jobs. And what will happen with them uh, is another story, which I think you can understand just well, as well as I do. But there are more subtle changes as well. For example, the working arrangements, which we know, and which we say that if you have a boss who works with five or six or seven people, he will try to find out who is feeling in what way, maybe say a nice word or offer his help or see by the expression of face that something is wrong, or be ready to see somebody unexpectedly, uh, that has stopped as a method of work by a very large increase of the people who have working 
at their home alone. Two problems there. Number one is, of course, that not everybody's home is suitable for working at home. But the other one is as well, working far from everybody else does not allow neither your colleagues nor your boss to be in the same relationship as they were before you were working separately. We have not yet learned how to organize teamwork, how to discover problems at work when people are working at a distance. Computers don't speak that language, the language of tears. It's something that we can see and learn if we are human, but we cannot see it from the machines. Of course, the economic consequences of, uh, have been described at length, and they are severe in multiple, and they will uh, make us suffer for a long time because the purchasing power of people has been reduced because of the the ways in which they're going to use their surroundings is different. So that the economic consequences in some instances will be catastrophic. In some instances, they will be less so. And many countries have now taken on themselves to enter into huge debt in order to be able to support at least partially people who are hit by the disease in the most severe form. And then I wanted to mention one word that worries me at my age, particularly, which is the digital divide. It's a word that has become popular now, which basically says you should do everything by using a computer. But if you have grown at the time when you spoke or used the pen, uh, and if you have never used these computers sufficiently, you are not as familiar with them as the children in school nowadays who do it with so much ease, so much elegance. So you are suddenly deprived of all the developments that have been, that are amenable to those who competently handle the modern technology of communication. And it's not easy to learn it all. Some people do go for courses, but others don't. And uh, they feel that they can manage somehow, but they can't. And so that the digital divide, which is becoming much more important now, as people are not any longer seeing each other, is of course, another problem that is of major importance. And many of the social strategies of how we greeted people or how we said hello and how we made friends and how we read whether somebody is insulted, etc., have all been invalidated. That creates a major problem for us ourselves. We are not anymore certain. Have I left a good impression in this group? Can I come back to them? Do they like me? Do I like them? What is, what is happening here? Uh, I'm sort of floating in cyberspace but that's not life. It's floating in cyberspace, which should take a very small proportion of your life, not be the main form of your existence. A problem on a more political level is, of course, that with the infodemic and with the uh, huge differences between scientists and uh, political authorities and uh, introduction of measures that have been done in order to save the economy rather than life, uh, people are losing their confidence into scientific and political authority and how that can be established remains a problem that has not yet been tackled. But there are also silver linings of these black clouds which I'm describing. First, I hope that the frantic search for this new vaccine, which is now being available, uh, will in fact help us to discover other things about the nature of viruses and will not only create the vaccine, but will also open the doors to new scientific advances mm -hmm. that will be very helpful. I think that what we have recorded and learned as failures in this particular dealing with this pandemic, which may, this may help enormously to people who come after us and maybe even ourselves when the next disease strikes. And then I think is a gain in knowledge, expensive in terms of human life, expensive in terms of economic downfall, but useful nevertheless and very precious which we should guard. Another uh, glimmer of hope and the lining, silver lining of the black cloud is the recent decision in Great Britain to start vaccination. And who has been selected first? The elderly, not who are sick, but elderly because of their age. Now, maybe this is not the right decision. Maybe they should be left behind. But the fact is that somebody started thinking, what is the ethical principle by which we are going to think not only about providing care for disease, but thinking about ways in which we are going to live with one another. 
it's an indicator of a change. And I hope that we can all participate in making this change take hold and uh, become a very important central way of deciding on things. And then I think I also hope that this misery that has been experienced in many countries and all the losses that have illnesses produced maybe reawaken our understanding, our clear understanding that societies can only survive if their members understand the importance of solidarity and promote it from day one, from a childhood, early childhood, to school, in all of the laws and in all other places. It is the only way for a society to survive is to have solidarity as a principle that governs its activities. Now, there are dimensions of solidarity. It is either open and includes everybody, or it can be closed. It may not be a, a, at all, a, this solidarity could be only for some people. Equally so, it can be depending on reciprocity. I go to give you something provided that I receive something. And this level of reciprocity may be different from one place to another. Now, if you look at this space that has been created by those two dimensions of solidarity, you can see that there are some, you can speak of generosity, that is giving to people without any reciprocity. It is good, but it is not the best. Receiving something and not doing anything for it uh, is in fact diminishing you. And although you have this, you also gradually become dependent on generosity rather than being able to participate in generosity. In some instances, reciprocity is minimal uh, and you have some privileges, but they are all restricted to a very small number of people. It's a group that helps each other and refuses. So they have high levels of solidarity within the group and zero to the other groups, which are equally separated. A third type of solidarity is the one that is present in sects and factions in which you have to be marked by a particular feature to be a member of that sect, in which case you will receive a lot and you will have to return a lot. And all these forms, I think, exist, but it's only the last one in which we are expecting that solidarity will be for everybody and that everybody must feel that it is a reciprocal affair that I can help others and that others can help me and that I'm obliged to help as well as it can expect that people will help me. And it's the constructive solidarity as a central remedy as well as a central pathway to a better future that we are seeing. So I think that the constructive solidarity means to accept that there are other people around us and that the survival of all of us depends on supporting one another. So, ladies and gentlemen, I think that I'm certain that it's unavoidable that the COVID syndemic will claim more victims and misery in the times to come. We are not yet there. I think when it finally abates, it will be so important that the humanity remembers every part and every mistake, every uh, success that we had, and that it creates strategies which will able, enable us to meet new challenges in a more competent way. And that we should also remember that everything that is possible should be done to make the people of the world, including ourselves, to accept the notion that the survival of humanity depends on enhancing and maintaining constructive solidarity among people of the world, all of the people of the world, and use it to overcome this pandemic and to face our future with more confidence. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Sartorius, for that excellent and brilliant oration about the pandemic, the 2020 view. Uh, I must tell you that uh, we have had a very distinguished audience. Uh, we have had the uh, you know, as you were talking, I was quickly going through who are all attending this. And I found uh, the current president of the World Psychiatric Association, Professor Afsal Javid, 
they made the past president of the world psychiatric association helen herman i must also tell you that there have been several deans principals of colleges university etc but being a, a ex faculty of the mans i am also proud to say that our current director dr gurraj was also amongst your audience also a similar organization such as the medical pastor association the scarf the director of scarf was also amongst the audience now before i hand over to uh, dipanjana our anchor it's my proud privilege to present to you i don't know how i can show this this is a plaque which the medical pastoral association would like to present to you and what is written on the plaque is uh, as follows the medical pastoral association is pleased to present this plaque to professor norman satoris for delivering the first dr joyce roman oration on pandemic and the mind the view from 2020 on saturday 12th december 2020 signed dr joseph george president mr samuel mohan secretary so as i conclude uh, as i conclude my brief uh, intervention and hand over to the anchor uh, let me on my personal behalf thank you very much dr sartorius for kindly accepting this invitation to deliver the oration from a very small non government organization in india we are indeed privileged that you gave you chose to give this oration for us thank you very much and over to the panchana the anchor of this program thank you professor dr norman sartorius that is an enlightening experience indeed the knowledge disseminated by you today is really invaluable will surely carry forward the learning into our daily lives we thank you for all your precious time and presence we are blessed to have you with us here today thank you once again as a fitting finale to this program may i now call upon mr samuel mohan the secretary of mpa for the vote of thanks good evening ladies and gentlemen i bring greetings to you for all of you from medical pastoral association it gives me immense joy to propose a vote of thanks first of all let me thank god almighty for this wonderful moment of the first memorial lecture in memory of late dr joyce romani the fir the first uh, secretary of uh, founder secretary of the medical pastoral association this noble soul is not is now in the presence of god we met in calcutta in st paul's cathedral about 30 years ago and she wrote me into the paripurnata and i had a privilege of associating with her in 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 calcutta it is an honor for us to have professor norman satorius an internationally acclaimed personality former director uh, health and uh, mental health and then uh, who uh, the past president of wpa and the psychiatry legend as dr mohan rightly put it he has graciously accepted our invitation and uh, uh, deliberated this uh, delivered this first international oration memorial in, uh, oration in memory of dr joyce sromani pandemic and mind the view from 2020 sir it was a very interesting and rewarding experience for all of us and as a, and as a, and the president the managing committee the medical pastoral association family is, is grateful to you for this unique great contribution you have kept the audience spellbound by your scholarly excellent presentation i'm grateful to dr joseph george our president and all the support and guidance expended uh, he extended to all of us in putting this program together i am also very grateful to dr mohan isaac our past president and our mc member for connecting with dr professor norman and making this excellent uh, uh, this even possible and um, for uh, introducing dr norman sartorius my special thanks and gratitude to dr ajit bede vice president npa for the active force behind 
and this entire event and for his valuable guidance and unhindered support when and he was available to us made available to us in at all times i thank ms ellen shinde convener of this program for her valuable inputs and guidance our thanks to ms ramula joseph for unfolding the history of medical parcel association from its inception from st mark's capital years ago we are delighted to have uh, dr paul thromani and son nadin and anita with us on this great occasion thank you so much for being with us uh, dr paul uh, nadin and anita I, i thank all my office bearers my committee and the staff who worked tirelessly were involved totally in working hard to make this event successful i thank telaga elan and uh, dipanchana for uh, designing and uh, producing this uh, beautiful plaque presented to professor sartorius i also place on record um, the re services rendered by mr ak sharma for all his technical guidance and support ladies uh, this lecture will be an an um, annual event ladies and gentlemen this lecture will be an annual event and uh, we're looking forward to you seeing in future as well thank you one and all and with the compliments of the season and god god bless you thank you so much thank you mr samuel mohan as the evening draws to a close i'm sure that all of us have been immensely benefited by the words of wisdom shared by professor dr norman sartorius and dignitaries from the mpa family on behalf of the mpa family i place on record our appreciation for all your presence and support please do visit our website www.medicopastoralassociation.com and do let us know if you would like to be involved with us in any manner today we have acknowledged the great initiative of late dr joy shirmani by holding the first oration ah. in her memory ah. by no less a person than professor norman sartorius a living legend thank you so much have a nice evening to all of you a special announcement we request all the mc members to stay back for 10 minutes as instructed by the president dr joseph george thank you once and all 5 minutes not 10 5 minutes is enough and dr sartorius the plaque will be somehow delivered to you in geneva uh, in due time <laughs> considering the covid restrictions etc i would have loved to hand it over to you personally but uh, i know that uh, you always travel with very light luggage and even if you had handed it over to you anywhere in the world you would have asked me to parcel it to you so we will try and do that and you it will reach you in good time thank you very much once again as you are leaving i want to say that thank you for joining and you made uh, mpa proud for this celebration look forward to continued support and uh, and involvement with mpa thank you have a good evening that is uh, with the permission of the chair one announcement from the yes. secretary we are yes. celebrating uh, the christmas uh, the residents will be celebrating the christmas on the 19th of december from 3:30 to 5:30 dr navin thomas president i mean ceo of uh, baptist bangalore baptist hospital the chief guest we will unite all of you to be present and uh, grace occasion or of the encourage our residents thank you so much and notice